Sure. Thank you, Sachin. So, uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, happy Independence Day. I'm really very impressed that so many, so many of you have actually showed up today. So, thank you for that. So, Jack here is going to be the session chair for the whole day. Right? So, you're the session chair. Cool. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. So first, we have two talks today. First, we're going to hear from Kabir Ramola from 11 to 12. He's coming from the TIFR Center for Interdisciplinary Sciences in Hyderabad. And he's going to talk about some numerical studies of granular packings and uh, stress correlations in the vicinity of crystalline and amorphous systems. So Kabir, feel free to start. Thanks, um, Jack. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. The title of my talk today is uh, Universal stress correlations in crystalline and amorphous packings. Uh, I'm going to describe some numerical as well as theoretical results on uh, granular packings, but of the frictionless variety. And we are going to measure stress correlations in these systems. And we see a very interesting universality emerging in uh, this system, and <clears throat> which we will um, sort of characterize both numerically as well as theoretically. So this work is done with uh, in collaboration with Roshan Maharana, who's a graduate student who's here in the audience. Ivanko Das is a former graduate student uh, and now a postdoc in Gottingen, and Pinaki Chaudhary, who is in IMSC Chennai. Um, so the outline of my talk is basically that I will uh, introduce and present a universal characterization of stress correlations in a-thermal systems. Uh, I study these stress correlations in particularly in energy minimized configurations. Uh, of athermal a particles, uh, which interact with some uh, soft interactions, which I will uh, detail in the, in, in the talk, uh, which we do both numerically as well as theoretically. And we will present results for these correlations in the stress tensor across a wide uh, variety of situations, including uh, very crystalline packings, as well as fully amorphous packings, and all in a whole range of uh, disorder between uh, these two uh, these two limits. And what we find is something very interesting is that at large length scales, uh, the correlations that are, appear in the stresses are quite independent of the microscopic structure of the packing and indeed are derivable using many different techniques, including a field theoretic derivation as well as a microscopic derivation, which I will detail uh, in this talk. Uh, and so this is something to do with uh, the local constraints of mechanical equilibrium showing up at very large length scales, which I will try to um, convince you of during this talk. Okay. So uh, what are the kind of materials that I'm interested in? Uh, we are looking at disordered amorphous materials, uh, which are basically made up of uh, constituents that are heterogeneous and also at large length scales, uh, they display elasticity. So, in, uh, so, for example, take a look at this uh, tissue, which is basically made out of many different components, uh, which are each individually elastic, but they also display collective elasticity. Similarly, you can look at uh, this foam, which also is made up of many different heterogeneous uh, units, but are, which are all in contact. And on the large scale, this foam also has some elastic property although each individual element also has its own elasticity, but what is the collective elasticity is, is a question that we are uh, going to address. Similarly, you can have uh, granular materials such as rigid particle packings that have uh, completely amorphous structures made out of very different um, constituents, but on the whole, they display some sort of rigidity or some sort of elasticity that we will be uh, interested in finding out uh, more uh, about the nature of, let's say, correlations or the nature of stresses in such systems. And I will uh, show you some, some data to back this up. Uh, but typically what we do is, is, in order to study such systems, is create very um, simple computer models that seem to reproduce many of the characteristics uh, that are associated with such systems. And so here is a picture of, of a simple bubble model that uh, people create, which is particles that interact with uh, nearest neighbor uh, interactions, where there's some overlap dependent energy or some overlap dependent force between the particles. And that leads to uh, a, a configuration that looks very amorphous. So even though each of these uh, sort of circular bubbles has its own elastic property, on the whole, this amorphous packing has a completely different elastic property that we will investigate. Um, and 
that's sort of the focus. These kind of models are the focus of my uh, numerical as well as theoretical results for today's talk. Although we can do these, uh, do the same analysis in experiments, and we also find very similar results in experiments, but I will not uh, be showing that in today's talk. So let me just recap the equations of uh, elasticity that many of you would be already familiar with, but uh, usually in continuum elasticity, what we do is uh, we write down these constraints of static equilibrium, which is basically you take the stress tensor of a system and you say that the divergence of the stress tensor is equal to some external force applied on the system. And in, in continuum elasticity theory, the divergence of the, uh, of the stress tensor can be related to some displacement fields, but through these uh, relationships uh, that are basically generalized versions of Hooke's law, that is, there's a stress strain relationship. So what I will write down is some strain tensor. So some pictures are missing here. So this is the displacement of one particle. So there was a particle I, there was a particle J, which was displaced by some, some amount UI and UJ. These are some displacement vectors of each of these particles. Using these two um, displacement fields of these individual particles, you can create a stress, sorry, a strain tensor, which is basically the derivative of these displacement fields. So this you would be familiar with. So you, you create a strain tensor epsilon ij using these microscopic displacement fields. Then you posit some sort of linear relationship between the stress and strain. And so sigma ij, which is the strain tensor, it's a two index object. You have a stress, uh, sorry, the stress tensor, which is a two index object sigma ij. You have the strain tensor, which is epsilon kl, which is also a two index object is basically related by some linear elasticity relationship where you have some generalized elastic tensor, which is now a four index object, lambda i, j, k, l, that connects the stress to the strain. So once you have this, once you have a stress strain relationship, you can now re replace this sigma in this equation of static equilibrium. And then you get an equation that is purely relating the displacement fields to the external force which is this well-known cauchy navier equation. So given the external force on the system, some F at a position R, you will be able to write down uh, an equation governing the displacement fields. Here I'm uh, considering an isotropic stress tensor. So it only has this bulk and shear modulus uh, in it. But in general, this lambda IJKL tensor can have all kinds of components. And so for example, if you have these metamaterials, you have um, very interesting off diagonal components. And also now you, we have, uh, recently, there are some theories of odd elasticity where some symmetries of this lambda IJKL tensor are not respected. And so you can have some very exotic behavior emerging. Uh, so this lambda IJKL tensor will be one of the focuses of my, my talk today. And what does it actually tell you in a granular packing? And what can you actually say about these, uh, these, sort, of, um, these sort of elasticity co coefficients from the stress correlations in uh, granular packings. So uh, these uh, elastic moduli are generally determined by microscopic properties, but uh, there are with some symmetries, you, you should be able to constrain them. And that's what we, I will uh, try to do uh, using the, the models that I was describing. Okay. So please feel free to stop me at any point if something is not clear. Okay, so in a crystal, it's quite easy to do such a thing where you can create a, a, the displacement fields from a well-defined reference configuration. But what if you have a disordered network? So then suppose you look, look at a state of particles in this sort of uh, arrangement. It's not very clear how we will write down continuum elasticity equations because this is a very heterogeneous and completely disordered arrangement of particles. So what you would have to do is on top of this continuum elasticity theory that might emerge at the large length scales, we have to impose the force balance constraints at the microscopic level. So the static equilibrium conditions on a packing of this sort become basically some network, network equations. So for example, this FGC is the force acting on, on a grain at a particular contact. So if I sum over all the contacts C belonging to a single grain, the forces on each of these contact forces. So there, there's one grain, let's say we have this grain here. It has these contacts and each of these contacts has some forces. When you sum up the contact forces, uh, you end up with some external force. Similarly, you can do the exact same calculation for the torque balance and the torque balance also must be satisfied on this network. So what you can do is create something known as a particle level force moment tensor, which is basically uh, this Rij outer product Fij or RGC 
auto product FGC, uh, but it's not readily uh, amenable to continuum treatments because as you can see, this is a very uh, heterogeneous um, arrangement of particles. So what, what we could do is try to understand if you can co-strain these stress tensors over a large enough uh, length scale and create uh, some coarse grain stress tensor field and then understand what the properties of this coarse grain stress tensor field is. Uh, and this also leads to some sort of elasticity properties, uh, which I will describe. Yeah. So just to figure, just to explain what the challenge in su such a system is, is that given that you know the network and you know that at large length scales, you have some sort of elasticity properties, it, th that is not enough to determine all the properties of stress transmission in such systems. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. So this external, mm -hmm. so are you applying some force externally to this ganglia? I would say that you could apply a force on every one of these grains. At this point, for example, this one, I don't have any external force. But, but yeah, this is zero. This will be zero. But in general, you can have some external. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at one of these uh, granular systems, which is sort of a, this is a granular pile uh, made out of photoelastic disks. So the more the st stress there is on, on a disk, the more it scatters light. And so here's just a granular pile made, made out of two different kinds of particles. And you can see that the stress transmission, so like any layer on this granular pile must support the weight of all the rest of uh, the particles above it. So there must be some stress transmission from the above layer to the lower, lower layer. But in an elastic medium, if I was just to create a completely continuous and homogeneous elastic material of this shape, I would see that the stress will be distributed in a very homogeneous manner. Um, but if you look at a granular network, the stress is distributed in a very inhomogeneous uh, channel like, uh, like propagation, which sometimes is known as force chains. So and each of these uh, sort of patterns is extremely dependent on what the network is. So what I mean by that is, if I take this, shake it, and I let it settle down again, I will not see the localization in exactly the same place. They will be localized in a completely different place. And so this sort of uh, would remind you of some river networks that, that form, which are basically channelized flow of stresses through a system of this sort. So you might think at the out outset, this problem would be very hard to solve uh, because it's so, it is so dependent on the particular network that I'm considering. Uh, but still we can try to understand it on an average or we can try to sort of take many of these, uh, these packings and take uh, an average stress and try to understand if elasticity properties hold. And that's exactly uh, what we see. So yes, yes, please, hi, hi, yes. Um, so in these beautiful stress networks, um, they get brighter as you go down. Yep. I presume that's because there's uh, more and more weight exactly. uh, crushing a, a, from above. Exactly. Uh, is there some systematic law uh, like the law of atmospheres for this inhomogeneous system? And how does that change from realization to realization? The, the brightening as a function of the, the Z coordinate. Yeah. So the brightening as a function of the Z coordinate would be precisely dependent on the total weight. And you should be able to calculate that by just integrating the total mass above it. That is absolutely clear. But uh, how those localization properties change that we do not have a very good handle on. Thank you. So, I can just, uh, so you have two granular piles there, right? Mm -hmm. The one seems a little narrower than the other. What is the... What's so the, one of them is made out of particles uh, of... Different what, kinds of Different particles. kinds of particles. Yeah, yeah. So this is one pentagons and another one is some other uh, sided shape. Uh, here the setup is two-dimensional? Two yes, so this is two-dimensional in order to aid visualization. So uh, we tried to test such, such a theory where we said, let's look at the average stress response of one of these uh, granular packings, where you create a localized force in, one, in some region of the packing, which is like say three particles here, and you sort of balance it out by another uh, set of uh, forces, which are uh, along a line. Uh, so this would be uh, similar to a response of a point charge uh, 
uh, in this granular system. The reason that this is a point charge is because this is a localized force here, whereas it's completely diffused along this line. As, as long as this total system is force balanced, this, this system is not, not accelerating in any way. So uh, the reason that we would like to test such a configuration is because in crystals, it's very clear what the displacement fields should be because you have a reference configuration. Whereas in an amorphous system, you have no uh, reference configuration that you can sort of um, expand about. So the displacement fields in such a system are unphysical, uh, but yet we can sort of look at an average stress response over several realizations, over several realizations. And uh, we can see this linear elasticity results reproduced in uh, such a system. So uh, here is a stress tensor of a system before and after uh, applying these forces. So uh, this is before we have some fluctuations in the stress tensor. This is sigma xx, which is the pressure of in the system, and sigma xy, which is the sh shear stress in the system. So you can see that it is completely uh, inhomogeneous and also uh, fluctuating. But once you put these external forces in the system, you see there's a response on average. So that is when you average over several realizations, uh, you will see a very nice uh, picture of continuum elasticity, which is this theory of continuum elasticity predicts. So what, what is the take home message from this? Uh, well, you take a completely disordered amorphous material, apply certain external forces on it, look at how the stresses uh, are responding in such a system, average over several different configurations, you end up with continuum elasticity. Whereas each individual configuration is inhomogeneous elastic. Uh, whereas if you take an average, you, you see continuum elasticity emerge. So let's take this one step further and try to understand if we can calculate correlation functions from the system. So let me go back and ask the following question. Take one configuration of this amorphous material and look at the stress tensor in such a material. Then look at an uh, ensemble of these configurations and ask, uh, does this ensemble obey some sort of statistical mechanics? And can, can you compute correlation functions in such a system. So here's a simple attempt at writing down a field theory for the stresses in an uh, amorphous material. So you can just postulate a partition function of the following sort. You say, in general, when you have a Boltzmann distribution, you will write down that the, the configuration of a system is determined by some e to the minus s, which is s is some action or is some energy function. Uh, whereas, as I told you, amorphous packings are in the zero temperature limit have to be completely stable. So in addition to having some Boltzmann-like function, you must also impose stress tensor balance at the local level. So we basically postulate a very simple partition function. That is, there is a local stress tensor uh, balance at, the, at every point, and there is, each configuration is drawn from some Boltzmann-like distribution, where this action, you just posit a Gaussian action of this sort. So usually what you would do is write an energy function, which is strain into stress. So that would be sigma ij into epsilon ij, as I said. So the epsilon ij, which was written in some sort of lambda inverse ijkl net, uh, notation that I had, you can write, write down a completely uh, Gaussian action, which is now basically just made out of this sigma ij and sigma kl. Why would you want to write down an action which is stress only? Right? Because as I said, in an amorphous material, we don't really know what the st strain tensor is. Because now I'm looking at an average over many configurations. The strain tensor is not taken from any particular reference configuration. What you can do is measure the stress. The stress is a measurable quantity. The strain is not a measurable quantity. So you will write down an action made out of just the stress tensor. So this is what you would postulate. And given this partition function, we can readily just compute the correlation functions. Yes, please. Just one second, this is, mic is coming. Yeah, thanks a lot, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that uh, just before applying your stress or you disturb the system, you have one configuration of the system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you apply some disturbance, then you uh, get that uh, distribution of the strain. Uh, yes. That. But my point is why don't you take the initial configuration as the initial uh, state so that you can get the strain tensor also? That's a very good point. So that one configuration for one sort of perturbation is completely correct. But now when I'm looking at an ensemble, then I don't have one reference configuration for the full ensemble. Usually what you would do is write down 
one reference configuration from which many different configurations are drawn. And all of them have the same reference configuration. So if I sort of go backwards and say, I have one configuration and I go backwards to the reference configuration, then I average over all the back configurations. I don't get one single unique configuration. Is, is, that, is that clear? So uh, yeah. not a unique uh, reference frame you're saying. If you want to take the reference, then you have to continuously vary the reference frame. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's why the amorphous okay. uh, system is, is different from a crystal. Whereas, so it makes sense to develop a stress only framework where you can then compute the correlation function. So you're writing down the simplest Gaussian action for the stress tensor and also imposing uh, this uh, stress balance at the local level. We see that you can, cal now you can just trivially calculate the correlation functions knowing that we have a partition function. Uh, and here I have uh, displayed the correlation functions that we expect in the stress tensor. So this D is basically uh, the stress tensor. So uh, I, I, we, th there's a mapping to uh, something known as a tensor gauge theory, uh, which I won't go into in this talk, but uh, this D is like, like the displacement field, uh, the electric displacement field of a tensor, uh, tensor uh, theory. And so that's why I've called it D here, but this is to be uh, taken as the stress tensor of the system. So capital Sigma. Uh, so what we can do is compute the stress tensor correlations in uh, Fourier space uh, with, so yes. Could I ask? Yes, please. You, you, in your previous, so you set up a certain choice of state, you apply this, and then you look at, you sample the, the stress in the next stage in the partition function, you sample from this? Is that what you do? From here? Yeah. Yeah. So what we are doing is we're just creating many uh, uh, disordered packings without this force. So we can, initially what we did was we tested the response, and now we are putting all the forces to zero, and we're just checking the full ensemble of amorphous packings without any external force. Construct partition function, you sample over many of these. Yes, we sample over many of these. And the lambda IJ So the lambda IJKL is now going to be some sort of fitting function because we don't really know what the lambda IJKL is. There is no elasticity theory connecting them. So what we will do is measure the predicted stress correlations and whatever we get will be our lambda IJKL. Yeah. So you will do this averaging procedure sampling the sigmas and then you will exactly fit, you will fit for lambda ijkl to get some kind of linear response precisely we, some sort of i would say generalized elastic moduli so a gaussian theory would predict for you what the correlation functions are in terms of lambda ijkl measuring the stress correlations will allow you to now go back and understand what a lambda ijkl tensor will be in in such a amorphous setting Thanks. Eh? Yeah. So this is the predicted uh, correlation function. And if you just put in the simplest assumption of linear elasticity uh, of, sorry, isotropic elasticity, you will get the stress tensor correlation. So this is the sigma alpha Hello? beta, sigma gamma delta. Yes. I have a question. Yes, please. Yes. So here, um, the linear elasticity is an assumption or it's a... No. So let me go one step back. What we, what I showed you in this slide is that Continuum elasticity of the linear type emerges upon disorder average. That's what we are, that is what I'm showing here. But that is not what we are assuming. What I'm assuming now next is no linear elasticity. I'm saying, suppose you have a configuration with a given stress tensor distribution. What is, let's say the weight of that configuration. I'm saying, okay, to a first approximation, it's, a, it's valid to just look at a Gaussian uh, sort of action for that stress tensor. That is what I'm assuming here. And then using that, this is not a linear elasticity. It looks very much like linear elasticity, but this is just, a, just an assumption of quadratic uh, energy function. So what is the G here? What is G? I don't know. Oh, G. Yeah, so the G would be basically, uh, okay, here, this is the coupling constant. So this is like a stiffness constant, which I can tune around. I can put a G equal to one if you'd like, because I get an overall normalization factor. So here the integral is representing average over the particles. Or this one, this one. Yeah, here one integral and one integral mm -hmm. on the top. Yeah, yeah, so let me put it this way. This is the energy of a given configuration. So sigma ij r is a field, right? This is the stress tensor field. Given the stress tensor field, I will basically write down one full energy function. That's what I do, right? Given that energy function, I can calculate the correlation function. So this represent this represents the integral of a space of a one configuration. This represents a part, 
a variation of the sigma over all possible points in space. Right? And so you, we can predict something like this. So one of the very interesting, uh, let me just go to two dimensions and ask, what does this theory predict in two dimensions? Okay, so let me assume to have a form of a coupling matrix between the stress tensor sigma xx, sigma xy of, of the type, which is basically isotropic elasticity, right? And this is some assumption with some uh, stiffness constant k2d that I'm defining here. What you see is in Fourier space, when you calculate it, you get something known as pinch point singularities, um, which are basically that if I were to measure the stress tensor sigma xx correlated with the stress tensor sigma xx, I would see this very nice behavior of sine to the four theta and y, 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 y would have this cost to the four theta and so on. So what do I mean by pinch point singularities? And you can see one thing very interesting here. These are completely independent of Q. So that's what um, the theory would predict. A Gaussian action for the stress tensor with this coupling matrix would predict these correlation functions. And it's quite remarkable that, you know, we measure these and we actually see that this works. And I, I will show you in much more detail uh, exactly these predictions from a microscopic perspective of the many different models. So this is what the prediction from a field theory would be. And uh, what you see are very interesting. It's independent of Q. Usually, if you were, were to have a Gaussian theory, you would have a one by Q squared dependence of, if it was hydrodynamic. Uh, but here, you have no dependence on Q. And it depends on the angle. So if you were to approach Q equal to zero, which is the long wavelength, uh, the long length scale limit, from different angles, you get different behavior. This is called pinch point singularity behavior, which is sort of a hallmark of these tensorial uh, gauge theories, uh, which, which I will show you and hopefully convince you is coming from some local uh, underlying um, force balance conditions uh, or stress tensor balance conditions that lead to these kind of correlation functions. Okay, so with this preamble, let me go and show you what kind of models we can do exact calculations on and derive correlation functions for these uh, for these systems. So uh, we we'll, we'll look at these very interesting bubble like models where you have uh, where you can put disorder in uh, the size of the particles, the 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 interaction strength between the particles, Kij would be some interaction between the particles. Uh, we can also put uh, some external forces, which I will not consider in this talk. We can put some randomized external forces. We can, the, the two kinds of disorder that I will consider in today's talk is disorder in the distances uh, and consequently in the interaction strength between particles and disorder in the adjacency or neighborhood of the particle. And two of the paradigmatic models that I will consider in today's talk are this, one of them is these bubble models where you have some interaction uh, between particles if they overlap. And another one is this uh, sort of extended range interactions, which are known as Leonard Jones with the cutoff. So these, this central particle will be uh, interacting with uh, particles up to the range of uh, three shells. And we can put some disorder in, inside these interactions to cr create crystalline packings as well as amorphous packings and see stress tensor distributions in, in such systems. Okay, so here's uh, one of the, yes, please. Yes, please. That's what happens when the, say, the large particles uh, pucker into the third dimension. Um, we if haven't keep considered it, keep that. it approximately flat, mm -hmm. but let it let it go uh, a little bit into the third dimension. You would presumably get a wrinkled surface that would be very responsive to the disorder in the sizes and the lengths. That would be an interesting point. So what we can study, for example, is if you decrease the size of one of these particles by a small amount, then we can, depending on the disorder and the arrangement, we will be able to predict what the stress tensor is. So I would say puckering of one of the particles would be akin to just decreasing the size, effective diameter of one of these particles. I would say be increasing. Or increasing. Yeah. Yeah. Or increasing. But, but I think uh, decreasing is also very interesting because it produces little hyperbolic uh, points of... Uh, Singularity, a little ga negative Gaussian curvature as opposed to positive. I see. And so I, I, I would, these are very nice methods, and I would encourage you I will try to look that. at these wrinkled systems. I will try that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. If so, let's hold off. But can you give some intuition as to why these correlation functions are Q independent? I see. Uh, so basically, it's because. Uh, if I looked at those earlier pictures you showed, that's not, you know, that's not what I would have thought, right? You, do, you see scales and you see sizes of objects. Yeah, so a simple way of saying it is, if you were to look at displacement correlations, you get, you get a one by Q squared dependence. But now if I was to look at stress correlations, I would have one extra derivative added, like DI of this would be added to 
my correlation. So I'll get a QI, QJ by Q squared kind of dependence. If I was to look at DI of U correlations, then I would get a Q independent correlation. Stresses are like this DI of U. So in the microscopic derivation, also you'll see uh, where that di of u comes in. Um, yeah, so we study particles basically that are interacting through these uh, short-ranged uh, one-sided potentials of this form, where you have um, basically uh, interaction of this, uh, which is like a bubble interaction. So you, if there's an overlap, for example, if rij is the distance between two particles, is less than the summation of their diameters, aij is the sum of their uh, di di diameters, uh, then this interaction turns on, which is basically like a spring interaction, where alpha, usually we take alpha to be two, but for alpha, for five by two, for example, would be the Hertzian interaction that is uh, considered quite a bit in granular systems. Uh, and if there is, if the diameter of, the, uh, if the distance between the particles is much greater than the diameter, uh, then there's no interaction. So what you can do is add quench disorder into such systems uh, in the form of uh, changes or heterogeneity in the uh, uh, radii of the particles. So you can say that each of these radii AI, uh, so here AIJ was basically AI plus AJ. So AI is the, the, the radius of each particle uh, can, be, can be distributed as some A naught times one plus eta zeta i, zeta i is some uniformly distributed variable, and eta now controls the strength of the polydispersity. So if eta is zero, all the particles have the same size. But if you change eta and you tune eta, you can basically create a distribution in the sizes of the particles. So I hope that's clear. And eta is basically also known as just the polydispersity. And you can choose, uh, sorry, A naught. This is basically A naught to be half. And zeta is some continuously uh, uniformly distributed, for example, variable. Yeah. Similarly, you can do uh, the same thing and add, add um, disorder into the Leonard Jones interactions, uh, where you can say AIJ represents now it's not a simple uh, summation over radii. It's each uh, pair of particles has some AIJ, which is uh, this, the, the length scale of the interaction between those two particles. You have some Leonard Jones with some uh, cutoff and it, you create some smoothening at the cutoff and the cutoff is at some RIJ by AIJ is uh, 2.5, which is the typical uh, Leonard Jones cutoff that uh, is used in uh, models of glasses. And you now add some extra terms to this interaction just to smoothen the potential. So it, it goes to zero at this value of 2.5 and you just add some extra uh, polynomial terms in order to create a smoothness of the second derivative and so on. And the interaction strength, which is the, uh, uh, energy beyond uh, this 2.5 is zero, basically. That's the cutoff. Uh, so this is now a longer range interaction, not just a nearest neighbor. And quench, di quench disorder can be added into these interactions by uh, sort of uh, labeling uh, particles as small and large. And then you can create some uh, quench disorder in the AIJ, which is the interaction strength. Uh, let's say is equal to lambda SS if both I and G are unlabeled. And you can also interpolate between the others, the small and large or large and small and so on. And again, if eta is zero, which is the polydispersity parameter, um, all particles are small. But if you add, uh, uh, if you tune eta, some of them become large, some of them become small, and you have some heterogeneity in their interaction. So you can basically tune this eta and create a crystalline or an amorphous packing based on how large your uh, tuning parameter is. Okay. so. Let me now show you some results of what happens when you uh, tune the polydispersity starting from a crystal. So here is a very nice sort of study that's been um, done recently on uh, crystals and tuning the amount of disorder uh, to reach amorphous structures. So here is a starting from eta equal to zero, which is no polydispersity. So all particles are, e are equal sized. You create this pure crystal. Now you tune the eta, you, you increase the polydispersity and some of the particles uh, now lose contact. So here is uh, the, the color coding is the number of contacts of each particle. And so you start with all, all particles with six coordination. And then as you increase uh, the polydispersity, some of the particles become larger, some of the particles become smaller. And 
some of them lose contacts. So you have some now with five contacts, some of them with seven contacts and so on. And this is what it looks like with this small polydispersity. Then you increase the polydispersity even further and you start to see this very uh, amorphous structure emerging where, and you go to this very, very large uh, eta limit uh, and you see a completely uh, amorphous pattern. So using, by just tuning eta, you can go all the way from a crystal to, to an amorphous packing. And one thing to be noted here is they're all in energy minimized situations. So what you do is you start with a crystalline configuration, change the radii of some of the particles and go to an energy minimum configuration. So this is all purely in the a thermal limit and you can create this uh, transition between crystal to amorphous. So you can say, yes, please. So uh, for that uh, intermediate polydispersity 0 0.04, why do you have linear chains? Yeah, that's a good question. I do not know. Yeah, yeah. I have a related question. Yeah. The, the system on the left has uh, both translational order and, and orientation yes. order. The one on the right has neither. It has neither. And so along the way, do you have something with orientational order, but no translational order? In other words, you, you break the symmetries, uh, restore the symmetry uh, uh, sequentially. Um, and that might be related to these chains. I mean, there are other, if you do amorphous uh, particle packings um, by vibrating uh, ball bearings in a dish, mm -hmm. uh, then as a function of the composition, you do get uh, these hexatic phases. Exactly. That are but here you do not. So I, I understand the question. So you, okay. whether or not you have this two step kind of transition, uh, which we don't see. I'll just, in the next slide, I will show you what the transition looks like. We don't see the two-step uh, scenario in this because it's not thermal. So uh, here is basically what the phase diagram of this system looks like, what I showed on the left. Um, so as you increase, so the packing fraction is one variable that you can vary. So this is the in initial packing fraction and eta is the amount of disorder. So you can start with a purely crystal situation where, where eta is zero and you see a pure crystal on, on this side. And as you increase the eta, so that is if phi minus phi CP, which is basically the run, which is the hexagonal close pack phi, when phi is equal to phi CP, then the particles are just touching, which is the close packed uh, crystal. Uh, as you increase the packing fraction, particles are basically overlapping even more. So you need more disorder in order to start to break bonds. So if you now uh, add polydispersity in the system, you go from a crystal to some sort of disordered crystal uh, system, which is uh, which is not really breaking any uh, translation or um, uh, rotational uh, symmetry. It's actually already also in a long range uh, ordered state, but with some uh, peculiar properties of, of contact statistics. I'll just show you that. Uh, and we uh, then finally, if you increase uh, the disorder to some critical amount, which is seems to be a crossover. You see a crossover from a crystal to an amorphous solid, which breaks both translation and rotation symmetry. So this transition that I'm talking about actually is uh, some peculiar uh, hidden order transition, uh, which doesn't have an analog in equilibrium systems. Have you found a disordered crystal? Yeah, so the disordered crystal is defined as a situation beyond which part contacts have reached maximum heterogeneity. So there's a, there's a transition. Well defined. Do I have that slide here? No, I don't have that slide. So let me just uh, let me just plot it for you. Uh, okay. So if you were to sort of look at some system phi versus eta, you see there's some divergence here. Where, where chi, this is a strange variable. So let me just call it. Let's define zi minus z bar whole squared summation over i one to n. This is my chi, which is, this is the contact heterogeneity. So this is the number of contacts of each particle. And so if you look at this, this contact heterogeneity in the system, this seems to have a divergence at some value, which I showed here. And that depends on um, how much disorder you have and how much overcompression. So that's clear why you need more overcompression because if you have more overlap between the particles in order to break the contacts, you have to go to larger disorder. So the disorder crystal is, is basically defined as this side of the transition. Yeah. But it doesn't have any uh, different peculiar properties to this near crystal because the, the uh, amount of spatial order is very high. So if you look at psi six, as you can see here, psi six, and it's plotted in log scale, 
is actually very close to 0.99. So there's no real change between this and this. It's, there's a loss of both transmission and, and rotational order at the amorphous level. So uh, yeah, so this is maybe an artificial boundary, but this it seems to have maximum susceptibility to contact breaking. That's why it's uh, called a transition. Yeah. So now let's try to do some uh, analysis on this uh, on these kind of systems and try to do some exact calculations to derive correlations in the stress tense. So one thing to notice in the let's say the harmonic model that I was talking about is that the forces between particles. Uh, look very much like a linear spring uh, interaction. So Fij is basically some linear uh, spring chain, uh, sorry, linear spring law with this Rij. So this Rij hat is, is basically what is causing uh, issues in uh, solving this as a, just as a linear problem. Because this Rij hat, if you were to now expand them into their components, uh, sorry, this should have been x and this should have been y. Why? Uh, you can see that if you if you expand this into their components, you will see a completely nonlinear uh, looking force. So if I were if I was to actually uh, uh, try to understand the force balance condition, I will have to solve for these xijs and yijs in in this nonlinear fashion, right? Uh, so how do I solve this? So we have a nice trick. What you do, which you do is do a disorder perturbation expansion. So you take the crystal, and now you treat the the changes in the radii as a sort of perturbation away from the crystal, where zeta i is basically the change in the radii of each particle can be represented by a tuning parameter lambda and some delta zeta i. So as a response, so you start with the crystal, add some disorder in the in the interactions of the particles or in the radii of the particles. As a response to the disorder, there'll be some change in the positions away from the crystalline positions. So this some Ri, which is the, now the new position of particle I, would be starting from the crystal Ri zero. And you can have some displacements away from the crystal. This in turn will uh, lead to some changes in the interparticle force. So let me say that I had Xi, which is the X position of the particle. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so X position of the particle, it started from Xi zero with some displacement, Y position of the particle from Yi, Y zero to some delta Yi. Now I can use this in my force law and say that there's some change in the forces because of these displacements, uh, which I can then you know, input into my force law and try to understand what the change in the forces will be with respect to these uh, positions. So just to illustrate what you would do as a standard perturbation expansion trick is the change in the X component of the forces between particles will be related to the change in the X component of the displacements, but they will also be higher order terms. So you can do a term by term expansion. So this, the CIJ components will just be the Hessian matrix, for example, whereas the higher order terms will have some higher order derivatives of the potential. Once you have that, all you need to do is impose force balance. And so you, you can, sorry, so let me go back. And these uh, you can actually do using a Taylor expansion about the original crystalline state. Uh, what you see is that these C coefficients are translationally invariant because you are uh, looking at the, the reference state of the crystalline state. So you can actually uh, derive these quite easily and uh, each of these ij components are sort of uh, independent of i uh, which is very nice that allows us to solve many problems uh, because now you can just go to fourier space i'll uh, get to that in a second but what you do in order to sort of get the displacement fields is sort of you will perform a systematic expansion of the displacement fields uh, about the reference crystalline configuration uh, order by order and then you can use these displacement fields order by order and get the forces at every order, uh, and then you can match uh, terms at every order, and you can get a hierarchy of equations that de determines the forces uh, at every point, and you can get closure equations that can allow you to calculate the displacement fields uh, at every order. So uh, using that, so for example, let me just illustrate the procedure. Uh, you would get at first order, you would write down the, the forces uh, between the particles uh, would involve the first order terms of the displacement fields, whereas at second order, you would have uh, all of the uh, higher order terms of the displacement fields, uh, including uh, the bilinears composed of the first order. And here the zeta i, which is basically the disorder variable, can be treated as an input. And given the input disorder variable, you should be able to compute all the displacement fields. So using this perturbation uh, technique, 
what you can now do is in order to compute the force balance state or the athermal state, uh, you just have to impose the force balance condition at every order. So at the first order, you will impose a uh, force balance at the uh, first order of the forces. At second order, you would impose, uh, sorry, this is what the first order solution would look like. And at higher orders, you would basically impose uh, each of these uh, order by order and which would lead to unique solutions. So why would it lead to unique solutions? Let's see this equation here, which is basically the displacement fields at first order written in terms of these translationally invariant coefficients and also these zeta i's which are the underlying microscopic disorder. So given the underlying microscopic disorder, for example, the changes in the radii, I should be able to predict the displacement fields that are emerging from at every, uh, uh, out of every particle. Similarly, once I have the displacement fields at the first order, I should be able to use these to compute the displacement fields at second order. And that's what you can do as a hierarchical scheme. So let me illustrate what it looks like, right? So at first order, you can sort of just go to Fourier space because you just have, um, many equations which have all got translationally invariant coefficients. You can just simply go to Fourier space, calculate uh, the Green's function, uh, which will lead to a solution of this sort. So let me just illustrate what it means. So delta x at, at first order, the first order displacement fields at a position r will be written in terms of some Green's function with some source term, which uh, you can create out of the underlying uh, microscopic disorder variables. Uh, and similarly, uh, you can write it as a green, so similarly for delta y, which is the y displacement. Given that we know the displacement field at first order, what you can do is you can just simply derive the stress tensor, which is basically given as Rij Fij. And so I know X, which is the displacement field. I know what Rij is, compute the delta Fij and compute the stress tensor. So now what we have done is from the microscopic disorder, calculated what the microscopic stress field would look like. So we have a one-to-one -one map between the disorder variable and the stress tensor field. And so you can basically represent it by this equation. So Delta sigma a, alpha beta, this is the change in the alpha beta component of the stress tensor at any site R can be related through some Green's function, which is exactly determinable to the change in radii at every site. So delta A is the change in radii. So I can change one of the radii in the athermal state and I can calculate what the change in the stress tensor throughout the system is. And because it's right now, I'm just looking at the first order uh, solutions, everything is superposable. So I can just sort of superpose uh, all the disorder variables and calculate what the stress tensor looks like. So now that I know what the distribution of the stress tensor, because I know the distribution of the delta A, which is the change in the radii, which is drawn from some well-known underlying distribution. Once I know this distribution, I actually know the distribution of the stress tensor. So I can actually calculate the correlation functions without imposing any uh, field theoretical uh, um, sort of constraint on this system. I can just compute the stress tensor correlations knowing the microscopic correlations between the uh, radii. So let me just illustrate what we do with which is such an expansion. So you can create one defect. You can start with one particle, which is slightly bigger. And here we've calculated what the Delta X is. Delta X is the change in the X displacement. Delta Y is the change in the Y displacement. And you can say simulations, that is basically you change one of the sizes and then you allow all the particles to move, move away. The change in the simulation uh, simulations versus theory is exactly the same. But now this is the first order solution. What I can do is go and do the hierarchical imposition and at second order, which is basically look at the difference between the simulation and the first order solutions of the theory. And I get the answer from the second order theory. And it actually hierarchically solves the problem because it is a nonlinear problem at every stage. You can actually solve this hierarchically. Uh, let's just go back one step and see, do the solutions that we get from this nice hierarchical treatment actually give you continuum elasticity? At, so at large length scales, you see that you do see a one by R displacement field uh, away from one particle that's slightly bigger. And they, indeed they satisfy the cauchy navier equations of linear elasticity. And the, what should be taken away from here is that the higher order terms are not governed by any such equation. Uh, so that's very non-linear. And so although continuum elasticity is a uh, superposition, superposition is, uh, is valid and it's a linear theory, uh, higher order terms are not governed by such a thing. So let me just illustrate one aspect of nonlinear elasticity that can come, come out of su such a system uh, where you, you place one particle, which is basically a single defect placed at the origin, which is one particle that's larger. And I, you, you look at the displacement fields originating from one defect placed at the origin, which will have a first order term, as I said, second order, third order, and higher order terms. But then you can place another defect, which is another particle, which is a slightly larger particle at a distance delta, uh, away 
from this first defect, and this will produce its own displacement fields at first order, second order, third order. Now, if you place both defects together, you can place one at zero and one at delta, then you will have a whole set of uh, displacement fields coming from both defects, first order, second order, third order, and so on. But now, if you were to look at the linear order solution, the displacement fields due to both defects at linear order would be a superposition of uh, the first order solutions of each of these. But the higher order terms uh, do not obey such a superposition. So what you can do is you can create su such, a, such a packing, place two defects at two dif distances zero and delta, and subtract the linear order solutions. And what you should be left with is a purely second order effect which again, the theory that I was saying, this hierarchical force balance should be able to predict. And this is not a prediction that a linear, the linear elasticity theory would just predict that this would be zero. If you place two defects and you individually place the defects and you add them up, you will just get zero everywhere. But if you do, uh, if you do this on a disordered network, I mean, on a network of the sort that I'm describing, uh, you will see some second order or higher order uh, elasticity uh, corrections, which again, you can just check in simulations versus theory, and you should get the exact same answer. Similarly, you can ask, using such a perturbation expansion or such a theoretical uh, understanding, you can actually look at what happens to uh, interactions between defects. And I won't go into much detail, but you can actually uh, predict exactly what uh, the energy of interaction between defects will be. And here's something interesting about these emergent uh, laws that I was talking about. So emergent elasticity, if you average over many particles, uh, so many configurations. Uh, similarly, if you have two defects placed at some distance delta, what you can do is you can show that the in energy of interaction between these defects actually shows a power law behavior with an exponent four. So this is an, an exact analytic result where you can just say that there's a one by R to the, uh, or one by delta to the power four interaction energy between two defects placed at a, a distance of delta. And this actually emerges upon disorder average. So if you were to look at just one configuration with a lot of disorder in it, you won't see this power law. But if you take many disorder configurations and average over many of them, then you see this emergent power law uh, uh, emerging in such a system. So I won't go into detail. So now let me cycle back to the stress response of such a system in the last 10 minutes of my talk. So you can actually theoretically derive what the stress tensor would look like uh, for uh, each individual defect uh, placed in such a system. And using that, and sorry, this is the last slide with a lot of uh, equations. I'll go, uh, you basically are able to get the stress tensor correlations based on what the underlying correlations of the variables that uh, I put in. And this is just some source field that you should be able to derive using these microscopic uh, sort of coefficients that are drawn from Taylor expansion. So if I know what the A correlations are, A is the microscopic variable, which is basically like the change in the, in the uh, size of the particles, you should be able to predict exactly what the correlation function in the stress tensor is, right? So now let me, and th this is what it should possibly look like for those stress correlations of sigma xx, sigma xx. Okay, now let me show you some uh, configurations and some pictures of what the correlations look like. So here are the configurations of particles in commensurate whereas in, and in commensurate uh, lattices. So this is a commensurate crystal that you've created with some sort of disorder, uh, which has, you can see this very polycrystalline uh, sort of configuration with grain boundaries and so on. As, as you tune eta beyond some uh, critical value, you see that it, it becomes a completely amorphous state. And now what we can do is measure the stress correlations in configurations of this sort, configurations of this sort, and see if you see any sort of universality. Uh, so here is what the stress correlations in Fourier space looks like uh, from theory. So this is a theoretical prediction uh, using the perturbation expansion scheme that I showed you for the crystal. Uh, you can predict what the stress tensor correlations of sigma xx and sigma xx look like. Was, for example, sigma xx and sigma xy, sigma xy and sigma xy and so on and so forth. And you can actually do microscopic numerics on a very near crystalline configuration where eta here is actually 0.05, which is very, very tiny. So the, you can say that this exactly matches with what we see. So now to just cycle back, we want to see whether or not you can uh, predict this angular dependence that I was telling you, right? So if I was to look at C x x x x, and I zoom in in the Q equal to zero limit, here is what I mean by pinch point singularity. Pinch point singularity is along different axes that I measure. So along the x-axis, I'll get a completely zero uh, correlation function. Uh, 
Whereas here I'll get a non-zero correlation function. And if I was to look at the look at the um, angular dependence of these correlation functions, you'll see a very uh, clear pronounced sine to the four theta behavior uh, for this uh, correlation functions of xx and xx, uh, both in the harmonic model and in the Leonard Jones model that I was talking about. Similarly, if you were to look at xy, sigma xx and sigma xy correlations, you would see a very nice sine squared theta cos squared theta behavior. And similarly, if you were to look at yyxx, it exactly uh, matches the field theoretic prediction with an isotropic stress tensor that I was describing. Whereas these are also exact results, which I was uh, showing at the previous, uh, in the previous slide, where, where we can exactly compute this. So these are, this is sort of a match with the theory and numerics, but this is near crystalline very close to the crystalline state. So you would expect that such a theory would be valid. But what happens when you go to very, very large length scales and you look at very non-crystalline systems, you see the same correlation function. So this is the angular dependence of the correlation function in Fourier space. It has exactly the same dependence. So here's sort of my last slide about uh, what you would expect in uh, all, the, all the situations. So if you were to look at the correlation functions divided by the pressure code, pressure fluctuations in the system, both in the crystal and the amorphous. So here I'm showing a whole host of situations where eta is 0 0.05, 0.05, eta is 0.1, eta is 0.7, in the LJ system, in the harmonic system, all of them uh, in a wide variety of situations, both in the crystal, all across the amorphous state, you see that the correlation functions look exactly the same at large length scales. They have no dependence on the microscopic structure. They have basically very different crystalline order, very different, uh, I would say, contact networks and neighborhoods. But if the, the Q going to zero limit, that is, you're looking at this, this point, is the large length scale dependence. You uh, basically see a universal behavior of stress correlations in all these situations. And they're very well described by the isotropic correlations that I was uh, talking about in the tensor gauge theory or the stress tensor uh, partition function language that I described, but uh, they're also amenable to exact descriptions where you can actually co compute these correlations in an exact fashion. So um, with that, let me sort of, I will skip this part where you can actually change the pre-stress and you can change the pressure and see how the correlation functions change. Um, and you can of course, uh, derive these with uh, the theoretical analysis that I've pre presented. So the last point I would like to make is that you can try to analyze what this crystal to amorphous boundary would look like using these stress correlations. So if I was to look at this for the correlations of the stress tensor XX, XX component in Fourier space in the near crystalline limit, I would see that there would be a very well-defined Brillouin ensemble. What I mean by that is that there's a periodicity in real space, there's a periodicity in, um, in Fourier space as well. So here you can see a very well-defined Brillouin zone that, that appears when you're looking at even at an eta of 0.3, which is a very large polydiscosity. These are not very crystalline configurations, but if you were to measure the correlation functions in this, this is, this is a pure numerics, we don't have a theoretical understanding here, pure numerics, you were to measure these correlation functions, you see there's a Brillouin zone. But as you cross the crystal to amorphous transition here, you see that the large length scale behavior remains universal. Large length scale is Q going to zero. So you see this pinch point similarity with the sine to the four theta uh, dependence in the correlation function at Q going to zero, but the intermediate length scale physics changes and you see that the Brillouin zone is lost. So you actually see that the periodicity is lost, but keeping the large length scale behavior universal. So this is sort of a very intriguing signature of a athermal crystal to amorphous transition, which we are yet to investigate. So you can see that this, this is the Q going to zero limit does, it remains unaffected across the transition. That is what I mean by the large length scale universal properties. But there is some intermediate length scale changes that would be very interesting to actually understand. Uh, and this is sort of an answer to the question of, about what happens at the transition. Um, so this is something that would we are trying to understand in more detail where the changes uh, in this below zone structure, what would it mean in terms of let's say the partition function language that we were talking about. And yeah, with that, let me uh, just conclude. Uh, so we demonstrated both numerically as well as theoretically uh, the universality of stress correlations in static uh, athermal solids uh, at large length scales. So orientation order vary quite a lot in such structures, uh, but the fluctuations of the stress tensor uh, 
at large length scales uh, remain unaffected. Uh, these universality uh, basically emerges uh, from the constraints of mechanical equilibrium. What I mean by that is if you were to just take the most basic partition function and the only constraint you add is the fact that the that force balance or the stress tensor must um, satisfy a divergence free condition, you can predict the correlation functions in all of these situations. Uh, and it also can be done using these microscopic perturbation theory analysis that we were, I was talking about. Uh, you can sort of analyze features of amorphization transitions using stress correlations. And we hope to uh, soon understand some dynamical signatures of correlations, uh, which could reveal some very interesting differences between crystalline and amorphous packings. There are, there are some recent studies about entropy production in such systems, uh, which might be able to shed some light uh, on the differences or dynamical signatures between crystals and amorphous systems. Uh, but yeah, we are still uh, exploring these directions. So with that, thank you. And I'd like to take some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I'm happy to take them. Yeah. Uh, if I notice properly, then uh, the universal term that you are using in terms of the pairing the poly dispersity mostly. Yes. But you are still keeping your interaction is kind of linear. Uh, no. So that's what I'm saying. Let me go back. So I. We looked at two different kinds of interactions, harmonic as well as Leonard Jones, right? So both these, and I've plotted them all on top of each other. So let's just focus on this picture. Stress correlation sigma xx, sigma xx in Fourier space. These are all the results. So this is small amount of disorder for Leonard Jones systems, small amount of disorder for a harmonic system, uh, very, very large amount of disorder for a Leonard Jones system, very, very large amount of disorder for a harmonic system. Beyond the transition, before the transition, uh, yeah. Uh, har is that harmonic term is uh, sort of uh, capturing the ill stress kind of any inherent interaction in the system? Yes. Yeah. So let me go all the way back. So usually, when people study bubbles and foams, okay, okay, yeah. You look at these kind of models. So let me go back. Yeah. So these are the kind of models that we talk about. Okay. So if alpha was five by two, I would call it Hertz. Mm -hmm. We've kept alpha equal to two. So this harmonic interaction is basically between two particles. It's not some overall harmonic interaction in the system. Okay. Yeah. In such kind of system, mm -hmm. you the kind of force balance and uh, uh, evolution to in, due to the defects or something, how this, uh, because these are slowly relaxation system. If I look at any practical scenario, they're a very slowly relaxation system. Yes. How the relaxation affects such kind of... Uh... It's a good question. So we are not looking at dynamics in any of these studies. We did not look at how it relaxes to the energy minimized state. So we look at only the energy minimized state, like when full force balance is valid. For example, if you were to not allow it to go to the force balance state, then I would say that this scenario that I was predicting here, using this field theory, would not be valid. You will not go, so let me go all the way back to this prediction here, at large length scales. Yeah, let's look at this picture. This pinch point singularity will not appear. Right, you, it will get washed away at finite temperatures because this is really the large length scale correlations emerging from the fact that you have divergence free stress tensor at, at uh, locally, and you will not have any divergence free constraint when you don't have pure force balance. So suppose you were relaxing and it was not well balanced, then it would not have divergence free constraint on the stress tensor. So an interesting question. In fact, we have been testing this in glasses where the relaxation is really really slow. And Suraji, who's a grad student here, can yeah, explain this to you in detail. We have actually measured these correlations as you get closer and closer to the glass state, but it's not fully force balanced. And we see that this sort of structure will get washed away. And what we are thinking now, and we don't have a very good understanding yet, is that in the glass phase of matter, this kind of structure is what controls the slow relaxation. But we are we're still yeah, try, trying to understand this better. Thank you. So you talked about these disordered crystals. So yes. in, uh, Let me go in can you just uh, please elaborate it, uh, it a bit? Uh, Oops. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this very, I would call a disordered crystal. So is it very similar to this medium uh, MRCO kind of structures? 
I would say no, because the MRCO structure still has power law correlations in it. This one doesn't really seem to have these power law. It, it still has exponential correlations. So this medium range crystalline order and this disordered crystal seem to be different, but I do not know more than that. I, I know that this does not have power law correlations. Yes, please. There's something I, I don't quite understand about the uh, second uh, figure from the left. Um, you have coordination numbers, which are typically five, six, and seven, mm -hmm. um, and yet everything is arranged, arranged in a hexagonal lattice. Yes. That seems inconsistent. It seems inconsistent. So what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me try to uh, explain that. So these are really small, tiny overlaps. So when they lose contact, this overlap changes by a very, very tiny amount. So so if you were to do a Voronoi construction, every coordination number would be six? Exactly. Precisely. Okay. Then mm -hmm. I have a question, which is that in a real system, at least the ones that I, I've been looked at, to my knowledge, experimentally, uh, particles can rearrange in a non-trivial way, and you can get uh, little uh, dislocation pairs, for mm -hmm. example, yes. relative to a perfect crystal and so forth. And uh, would that not change your results? Um, uh, you have little plastic deformations, little strain centers. Uh, you know, Jim Langer talks about yes, these things. Yes. Would that, how does that affect your theory? So, yeah, so shear trans transformation zones and so on, which occur in such systems once you uh, uh, allow for larger disorder, seems to not affect our, sorry, let me go, seems to not affect the large length scale physics that we see in such systems. So, so seems meaning you've done a systematic study of finite size effects. Yes, so we have done change. Yeah, so we have done systematic studies of uh, what happens at much much larger length scales and looking at the stress correlations at large length scales, and we don't see any real changes in in the nature of the stress correlations, even once you've uh, got these sort of defects inside the system. But, but then if the strain, you know, the stress centers start to separate, if there's some sort of glide motion of these embryonic dislocation pairs, that will certainly change the large uh, scale correlation function. It's, 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 it's inevitable. It will break up the translational order, might break up the orientational order. So I can see that in a, in a simulation where you leave out certain deformations, you might have some uh, interesting universality, but I'm not sure it's universal. Uh, if oh. you uh, allow for these plastic deformations, which are undoubtedly present in I actual see. ball bearing arrays, for example. Yeah, so these glide deformations, you're right, yeah. would, could be long range right. and that could uh, change. But we did not uh, look at such uh, displacements, which are much long, much more long range in the system size, but I, I would be happy to- We can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. that's an interesting point. Because he said, if you have glide dislocations, which basically would be very long range, that could destroy this uh, universal structure. But uh, somehow we did not uh, see that in, in the simulations we've done. But again, I, I repeat an earlier comment. I would encourage you to uh, keep this simplification and let things buckle into the third dimension. Mm -hmm. And then I think you'll get universal wrinkles, okay. which would be uh, interesting perhaps to analyze. I'll, I'll take a look here. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, I think if there's no other questions, we'll thank the speaker again. And from now, 12 to three, we have the next poster session. Lunch will be in the middle of that, so you don't need to send to your poster the whole time, but there will be some poster judges coming around. So they're all set up outside. Um, and I think lunch is 12. Lunch starts at 12.30, just out in the usual place. So uh, yeah, please enjoy looking at the posters and the next session will start here at three.